All right, well, good morning, church. Good to be with you all. Real quick, before we get into it, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. Number one, please be praying for our students. They're up in Williams, and they're getting dumped on with snow. They're coming back today. But just continue to pray that God moves and works in their lives. Pray for the volunteers, right? All that they go through as, as well. I want to let you know what uh, is coming up in the next couple of weeks. You know, it's, uh, we're starting the year with a bang. Let's put it to, let's put it to you that way. Next Sunday will be our eighth birthday celebration. No longer toddlers, kind of moving out of our goofy stage. Now we're eight years old. God has some incredible things in store for us this year, some really unique opportunities to expand the kingdom. I'm gonna share those with you. Now I was thinking about, for those of you who are new, I'm gonna give a little bit of our history as well. Talk about where we're at today and where we see God leading us into the future. So that's gonna be next Sunday. Make sure you're here for that. And then two weeks from today, we have a very special guest, a man by the name of Peter Williams. He is the principal at Tyndale House in Cambridge, UK. Tyndale House houses one of, in my opinion, the finest theological libraries uh, on the planet. And uh, Peter, being the principal, oversees this. And he is a very well-respected authority on the subject of, can we trust the Bible? Is the Bible reliable? In fact, he wrote a book titled, Can We Trust the Gospels? I'm gonna be interacting with him on that Sunday in a Q&A format. I would encourage you to invite your friends, your family, those of you who are skeptics, please return. If you've got a friend that's a skeptic, please invite them. What I would say is, Christianity is not a blind faith. It's the furthest thing from it. It is a, actually a well-reasoned faith. How do we know that what we have in our hands is accurate? How do we know that as it's been handed down, it hasn't been distorted or polluted? Do we actually have the words of Jesus? Well, this is the space that Peter lives in, and, and uh, it's, it's a rare opportunity, so I'm very thankful that we get to be with him. That's two weeks from today. This morning, we are in Romans chapter nine. Oh, we have some theologians in the crowd already. Some of you have been waiting for this chapter. If you don't know what we're talking about, here's the deal. We don't shy away from anything in the Bible. We teach the full counsel of God. The reality is Romans chapter nine, that's in the deep end, okay? This is some of the more theologically complicated passages in the entire Bible. I'm gonna do my best to try to keep this from feeling like a classroom. After the first service, I thought, maybe I bit off a little bit more than we can chew. I don't think so. I think we can handle it. If you want to resource a good commentary on the book of Romans, you can go straight to the comments on chapter nine. If there's one or two pages, that's a hard pass. If there's one or 200 pages, that's one that you wanna keep. This is the deep end. My job is to not make it simple because it's not simple, but my job is to simplify it, make it understandable, and also make it relatable and applicable. So here's the setup. In Romans chapter eight, the very last section, Paul gives this rapid fire, it's one after another. This is this escalation of joyful statements. And this is in response to him contemplating the overwhelming love that God has for humanity. He says, well, as I think it through, God's plan to redeem man, he says, since God did not withhold his son from us, he gave us his best, what makes us think God would withhold any other good thing from us? All good things God is gonna supply to us. And it's as if at this point, he begins to climb the top of the mountain and it's like there's this crescendo moment where as he reaches the summit, he looks out over the horizon and all he sees are dark storm clouds and the tone changes dramatically from one verse to the next. Chapter eight ends on a high point. Chapter nine begins with a sense of dread. Let me, let me tell you, let me show you what I'm talking about. This is the way chapter eight ends. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the mountaintop. Turn the page, dark clouds. I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. What I'm about to say to you is important, listen up. I'm gonna reveal what's going on inside my heart right now. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish inside. You're like, wow, where are you going with this? <laughs> like, what happened all of a sudden? Well, here's what's happening. As he contemplates the goodness and greatness of God's overwhelming love for humanity, he begins to realize my Jewish brothers and sisters, they have not accepted it. In fact, they've rejected it. And to make matters worse, of all people on the planet, they have special rights and privileges and advantages that no one else has had. And they dismissed it all. Verse three, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for their sakes. He's literally saying, if I could give up my seat on the bus, I would do it. They're my kinsmen according to the flesh. Now what he says next is, again, of all people, they should have taken advantage of this unique relationship that God had with them that he didn't have with any other people group. Watch this. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. To them belong the patriarchs. And from their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. These are some intense emotions powered by Paul's intense love for his brothers and sisters who, as he'll say later, are literally lost. And it's a shame, man, because he reminds us that of all people on the planet, when God chose a people group through which they would be a window to see who God is and how he interacted with humanity. It was the Jews. It was the nation of Israel. That's the nation that he created. He says, they have all the great patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Jacob, King David, Moses, the great lawgiver, of all people on the planet, God entrusted to them his word. They had it all. Every promise was spoken to them. They had it all. And not the least of which, the Messiah would come through their line. Jesus was a Jew. And when Jesus arrived, what happened? Well, the religious leaders said, crucify him. Paul says, I'd give up my seat on the bus for them. I wish I was accursed so that they could have what I have. They had this great favor that others didn't have. They didn't take advantage of it. They dismissed it. But not all of them ignored God's favor. Some were faithful. Paul himself is one, right? Paul was a Jew. He's also Roman, Roman citizen. He and his dad were part of the religious ruling elite, the Pharisees. And, and previously, Paul believed that he could earn his way to heaven by keeping the works of the law, everything that God instructed to Moses. Paul thought, if I could just do that religiously, God will smile and throw open the gates of heaven. And he said, well, really what that ended up being was a form of righteousness that was wrapped around myself, that is to say, self-righteousness. That's always what works-oriented religion leads to, by the way. You think you're better than everybody else. Then I realized it's not self-righteousness, it's the righteousness that comes to me from Christ. That's the Messiah, the Savior. And Paul says, I got it. I got it, but not everybody did. Now, um, 
I still appreciate Paul's heart in this, and I think maybe you can relate as well, perhaps. Uh, many of us, we've gotten together with friends and family over the holidays, and, and there are these, these there are many moments of great joy and, and happiness, and you're around these people that you love, and there is at the same time a deep underlying sadness because they don't know Jesus or they're far from God. And you feel that. Oh, there are, there are good times for sure. But then you begin to realize they too are lost. And that's exactly where Paul's heart is. Martin Luther said it well. Love is not only pure joy and delight, but also great and deep heaviness of heart and sorrow because you care about the people you love. Like Paul, our hearts break. Now what Paul does next is interesting. I have often said that he's a brilliant writer and there are some who have questions about this. And so, true to his style, he's done it before, Paul introduces an imaginary objector, very persuasive. It's one thing for me to communicate what I believe, it's another thing for me to communicate what I believe and then to anticipate your objection, and that's exactly what he does. Because at this point, some could say, okay, well, you know, you're telling me that God was faithful to his people, even though they were faithless, he remained faithful. He gave them great men and women to communicate his truths, they ignored him. He provided the Messiah, they rejected him. He made specific promises to them, they broke their side. They didn't keep their side of the promise, but God would still be faithful. And they've turned away from him. Doesn't that mean God himself is a failure? Hasn't he failed? Paul responds by saying, no. Let me tell you about the character of God. And one thing in particular, I'm gonna talk to you about God's sovereignty. Of all God's attributes, it might be this one that is most precious to believers because it's the idea that there are no mistakes, there are no actions. There's never a moment in time where God says, wow, I did not see that coming. What a surprise. Never happened with God, never once. So Paul says, no, God hasn't failed. Here's what you don't understand. God is absolutely sovereign and he's always working a plan and it will never be thwarted and that plan has a purpose and it's always for his glory, that which he can reveal about himself. Now, uh, this is where Paul begins to lay down the doctrine of election. If you don't know what that is, I'll explain it to you simply. Election means that before time existed as we know it, God chose those whom he would save. That's Romans chapter 9. Now, immediately, if you're thinking, you should be asking this question. How is that fair? How is that even fair? That doesn't seem right. Again, Paul anticipates this. Before we get into his response, I wanna make a, I wanna say this uh, ahead of time. I wanna quote from the prophet Isaiah 55, just to put things in their proper context. God says this through Isaiah, for my thoughts are not yours. Neither are your ways my, my ways. Thank God for that. Just the patience of God alone you should be grateful for. If, if, it, if I was God, half the people on the planet wouldn't exist. You know what I'm saying? I don't have that kind of patience. Thank God his ways are not like ours. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I have found that as humans, we have a very low view of God and a very high view of ourselves. You see this reflected very often in American churches, by the way where very often the message is more about what God can do for you. You find it in some worship songs too, where it tends to be a, a bit more man-centered than God-centered. Some of what is taught here is beyond human comprehension. I used to struggle with this, full disclosure. You know, I'm the kind of guy that if things don't make sense to me, why would I wanna give my life for it? And then I started to think a little bit more critically though. Um, if me being a finite creation. If I was able to understand everything about the infinite, then the infinite no, is no longer infinite. The infinite becomes quite finite. Now I have another problem. Where is the supernaturalness of God? Nothing, nothing that we're gonna read 
contradicts reason, it does transcend it. That puts it in the mind of something supernatural. I'm actually okay with that. So Paul is gonna answer those who say, if the Jews are not all conforming to what God wants, then has God failed? Has he not kept his word? Verse six, but it, it, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So what he's saying is, not everyone is a Jew because of their bloodline. Now, if you're a Jew listening to this in the first century, you're like, excuse me? What are you talking about? The great patriarch Abraham, he's the one that started this whole thing. You know? No, we are Jews by blood, Paul says. Mm, not really. Not really. No, God is doing something more than you see. You can't put God in that box. Yeah, this is what you all expect. Be very careful with your expectations on what God does or doesn't do. Because very often God upends things. Now, let me give you a couple examples, says Paul. And I'm gonna give you some examples from our own sacred text, the Old Testament, which you all know well. You all know well. But, here's the quote, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. So immediately they're like, oh wait, oh. He's reaching back and he's using the patriarch, Abraham, and God's promise to him that you would have a descendant who will be blessed and give rise to this great nation. Now, back in the day, firstborn had all the rights and privileges, got the lion's share of the inheritance. And so what happens is in this promise, Abraham gets a little impatient because several years go by and he's like, okay, God, I think I need to help you fulfill this promise to me. He and his wife are way beyond childbearing years, so he takes his wife's servant, Hagar, gets her pregnant. This kid, Ishmael, is born, and everybody's like, okay, cool. We had to help God fulfill this promise. Ishmael's the man. And God's like, no. And everybody's like, yeah, but he's the firstborn. This is how it goes. And God's like, no, this isn't how it goes. It's not gonna be Ishmael. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. It's what God promises. It's what he states are counted as offspring. It's not gonna be Ishmael, the firstborn, like you all expect. It's gonna be somebody, somebody else. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah, now that's Abraham's wife, shall have a son. So you might know the story. Isaac is born. The second is the one who will receive the blessing. So Paul says, now hold on. There's one example of God upending things and not doing things the way you expect him to, and God would have to do a huge miracle to make this happen because Sarah is way beyond childbearing years. Paul says, now let me give you another example, verse 10, and not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, she had twins, Jacob and Esau, though they were not yet born, and look at this, and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. That's not how it's done. Yeah, but God doesn't do things the way you think he's going to do them. As it is written, Jacob, that's, that's the younger one, I have loved, but Esau, the older, I hated. Now, this is a relative use of the word hated. It's not in the sense that we use the word today. What he's saying is, I chose one over the other. So, and if you know the story of these two boys, Paul emphasizes a point here that you don't wanna miss. It's not as if God said, you know, one of these boys is gonna turn out to be really good. And so I'm looking through the corridor of time and I'm seeing his goodness and because of what I see in him that's good, I'm going to choose him. Paul specifically says, before they were born, before there was good or bad in either one of them, God made his selection. It's not based on what he saw inside of them because if you know the full story of these two boys, they're both pretty rotten. You know what the name Jacob means? Deceiver. You think that guy deserved anything? No, he didn't. God sovereignly chose him. It's, uh, it's obvious to Paul that Israel's failure to believe doesn't mean God has failed. There will always exist a true Israel, people like Paul, who respond because of God's sovereign election, not because, though, of what he sees in that person. Now, one could press in again and say this still doesn't seem too fair. 
uh, doesn't seem just. Well, he's gonna use another illustration, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? You're all gonna think this isn't fair. You, got, you have to love how sobering the scriptures are written, just the sobering content, you know, just the, the realness of it. It doesn't dodge these difficult questions, it meets them head on. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Let's talk about Moses. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So this word mercy literally refers to you getting something you don't deserve. Here's the story. God selects this people to himself. Time and time again, they keep turning their backs on God even after he provides for them, provides for them. They're slaves under the ruthless hand of the Egyptian Pharaoh. And God says, I'm gonna get you out. And then he performs miracle after miracle. He commands nature. He commands the environment. And the people see it. Eventually, the people are released and they have this crazy journey through the Red Sea where it parts and the people are walking through the water and they're like, wow, okay. I, I would think I should probably believe that God is real and worship him. And so then they pass through and everything kind of calms down and then Moses goes and he gets God's commands and he's gone too long and the people are like, hey, what has God done for us lately? You know what we should do? We should make some idols. You're like, are you insane? No, this speaks to the human heart. Then they start making idols and they turn away from God after all that God had provided for them. See, the question is not, well, couldn't God do a little bit more for humanity? Really, the response is, why does God do anything? That's why he says, no, here's what you need to say. I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy because here's the reality of the situation. No one is deserving. No one is deserving. So the fact that I, I, I would choose some, you should be grateful for. Next, Paul uses the example of Pharaoh himself to show that God's sovereign election is actually deeper than you might realize. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I actually raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So even with God's sovereign choosing, it is always with a purpose to reveal his glory, who he is. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. I think we can say that God was both severe and merciful to Pharaoh. Because if you read the text carefully, here's what happens. God is exceedingly patient. You know, gives opportunity after opportunity. And again, if you read the text carefully, what it says is that Pharaoh hardened his own heart several times before God intervened and said, essentially, is this what you want? Be careful of this in your own life. Is this what you want? I'll give it to you. I'll give you over to what you want. And then the text says, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh had done it once, twice, three times, over and over again. There's a principle there, again, you need to be aware of. You know, you, you're getting involved in something so many times over and over again, and then it's, well, what do you want God to do? You know, isn't that, in a sense, kind of the existence of hell? It's like a continuation of people saying, I could care less about the things of God. I'll live life on my own terms. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> You're gonna reap what you sow. Uh, another objection. If Pharaoh is completely and totally in God's hands to mold and shape, then uh, why would anybody in God's hands whom he molds and shapes be held accountable? Great question. You will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? Now the response is one you're not gonna like, human. Reminiscent of Job, if you know his story. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? What are you doing? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay which he formed to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable? 
use. One could argue here that the clay is also never fully pure. In other words, the heart of man is not neutral. It has a strong disposition in opposition to the things that God wants. Uh, it's like having kids. <laughs> it's like having a toddler. And you know things that the toddler doesn't. And when you speak to the toddler and the toddler looks at you like, what do you know? What do you know? I've lived for three years on this planet. <laughs> I think that's long enough. It's like God's response to Job. You wanna have this conversation? You ask questions, it's good to ask questions. I love it when people, you read the Psalms and David gets really raw, like, hey God, what's going on? I need help understanding this. Where's your face? I can't see you. Are you still there? Are you with me? That's good, I love that. You don't wrestle with something that you think is a fairy tale. God's response to Job when he starts asking is, hey, okay, let me return some questions. Where were you when I hung the stars? Hmm, okay. Transcendence, transcendence. So what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order with purpose to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. If you're a vessel of mercy and you're in the room, you're really glad that God works outside of the box because previously it was like to the Jew only. And he's like, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. God is sovereign enough to include those who are not within his chosen group initially which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Again, back in the day, God was, it was strictly and straight up a Jewish thing. If you were a Gentile, you had to convert to all things Judaism. Paul says, mm -mm, time out. Not, not, now the hard root of Christianity is Jewish because the Messiah is a Jew, but it's not about those Jewish rituals, ceremonies, and traditions anymore. Jesus fulfilled all those. And this was God's sovereign plan all the way, by the way, according to the prophets. This shouldn't be something new to you. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, what he's saying is no one is deserving. It's like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's nobody deserving. Why would God save any? What shall we say then? That Gentiles, non-Jews, who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness. That is a righteousness that is by faith, not by works, because that's what Israel pursued. Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works, they tried to earn their way to God. How many times can Paul say it in Romans? It doesn't work that way. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. The point of salvation is Jesus. They tripped over it. You know the thing about a stumbling stone is? It doesn't matter how many times you trip over it, that thing ain't moving. You and he kick your, hey, you're gonna have sore toes the rest of your life. I suggest you acknowledge the stone that has caused you to stumble. And that's the thing about Jesus, isn't it? Jesus left no middle ground. He didn't come on the scene and say, hey, um, I've got some advice for you. You can take it or leave it. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, what gives you the right to say that? Well, I'll come back from the dead. Okay. Okay. Paul has been emphasizing divine choice, but in these last statements, do you see what he's doing? He starts to introduce human responsibility. And you get to chapter two. My friends who are diehard election, how can I say it? Electionists, um, they lean heavy into the sovereignty of God. I get it, I'm with you. 
you got to turn the page to chapter 10 because in chapter 10, Paul says, having said that, let me say this, you're all responsible. As far as you're concerned, you have free will and you do have the ability to choose. That's why he says, uh, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's human responsibility. The Bible never says, try your hardest to determine if you are elect. Never says that. Instead, what does it say? Anybody who believes will be saved. I like it. But there's a lot here. There may be some things in your life that you need to lay at the feet of God's sovereignty. He's got it. And whatever's going on, whatever it is, even if you have, you don't know for certain, there might be vessels of wrath in your life that God has prepared. Sometimes what was once a vessel of wrath becomes a vessel of belief. That was Paul's story. You don't know. That's in God's jurisdiction. Relax. I hope that Illuminate has the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul, that our hearts have unceasing anguish for those who don't yet know Jesus. If you are here and you don't believe, this is your opportunity under the sovereignty of God. Yeah. There are no accidents, there are no mistakes. Some of you have been coming around for a long time and you've heard me say these words for a while and you have not believed. I don't know what God is doing in your life, but I'll tell you this. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to right now. I'm gonna have you bow your heads and close your eyes. It was Romans chapter nine that led some of the all-time great and most influential men and women of the faith to God. Because there is now a full awareness of what God has done and the mercy he has shown and he is extending that mercy to you. And what, what your response, you grab it, you take it, you cling to it. It comes in the form of the cross. That's why Jesus came, to die in your place. The Bible says we're all sinners. We all fall short of God's glory. We can't earn our way there. Because we're sinners, we can never get it perfectly right. But the pressure's off. Jesus comes, takes your wage upon himself, the wages of sin is death, and in return, you get eternal life. Good deal for you. I, I like to ask, what is preventing you from doing that? I'm gonna tell you what it is. It's your pride. It's because you think you haven't thought it through well enough, but you have enough to rely on. You have enough to rely on, I'm telling you. You have enough to rely on. Don't make any more excuses. And then I would say this, for those of us who are recipients of that mercy, what is the response? A straight up gratitude. Straight up gratitude that God cannot be put in a box that God does things so outside of what man expects him to, and you are blessed because of that. That's how God sovereignly works. But Father, we're just grateful for your mercy. I pray for those whose hearts you are tugging at, Lord. There are so many things, there, there, there are strongholds in people's lives, just as my brother Chris talked about. What a great example of being set free. God, help them to see them as such. They are strongholds. They're not giving life, they're robbing life. Why would you keep going back to that? Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pray that they would give their hearts to you even now. We pray this in your son's name. And in all things, you work for your glory. That's what we're asking for. In the name of Jesus, God's people said, amen.